Thank you so much, uh, Haven, for taking time to talk with me. Of course, my pleasure. <laughs> Amazing. So you are the executive director mm -hmm. and co-founder of mm -hmm. the Fish Welfare Initiative. Nailed it. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. Which is uh, which you started uh, because you attended a charity entrepreneurship Correct. incubator. Correct. Amazing. Okay. So now that we know that, um, I think yeah, we can ba basically just jump like straight into. Uh, I actually want to know like how. Um, or like, okay, so most of the episode will maybe be about fish because okay. that's what you work about sure, yeah, now. Yeah. Uh, but but like, how did you get there? And like, how did you end up in charity entrepreneurship? And for the people that don't know, what is like charity entrepreneurship? Sure. So many questions, I know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start with what is charity entrepreneurship? So charity entrepreneurship cool. is an incubation organization that quite simply launches new high impact organizations. They're part of the effective altruism community, which is a community that has heavily influenced me and has frankly improved my own life quite a lot. Mm. Um, so they're really focused on kind of doing as much good as they can and thinking kind of rigorously about how to do that. Yeah. My story and my story and interaction with them uh, goes back to my college days. So uh, yeah, I, like I was studying philosophy and computer science and mm. university in the US, which, you know, I thought was a super unique combination, but now <laughs> everyone else in EA does it. So now it's like, okay, <laughs> not, not as cool as I once thought, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I was uh, very passionate about uh, doing good for the world and specifically about animal rights and ending factory farming in our lifetimes. And uh, I was influenced by 80,000 Hours, which is a kind of mm. career advising another effective altruism organization that kind of gives advice, especially to young people, about how we can do the most good with our careers. Cool. So I went through kind of a process that they had of like looking at different options I thought would be good. So I thought about like working for different animal rights organizations like Mercy for Animals, for instance. Uh, I thought mm -hmm. about working for organizations to help people in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. um, I applied to several, heard back from none of them, except for charity entrepreneurship. Um, <laughs> So I, I kind of I applied there because I thought I'd be a good fit. I liked entrepreneurship. I had um, led my local animal rights group and my local effective altruism groups cool. at, at that college. Mm. Um, but I was still just an undergrad student. So I was quite surprised, actually, when I was accepted into the program. It's like, really? Like, <laughs> I'm the best you can do? <laughs> like, you want some 22-year-old undergrad kid to start a new organization? <laughs> okay, I'll do it. But... <laughs> Like you've been warned, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So right after I graduated, um, a week later, I packed my bags and moved to London. I, wow. On a personal note, I kind of like became a nomad at that point. I've been kind of living out of two backpacks ever since. Mm. It's been quite rewarding for me. Um, yeah. And then I did the incubation program there. It was just two months and really just one month of classes. They don't they teach you like all, all the, the stuff you kind of need to know. It's like mm -hmm. budgeting, hiring, firing strategy, fundraising, that's all important. But really the mm. most important thing they, I think, give to a lot of people like me who kind of were like, really, I can I really do this? Is kind of the confidence to believe in yourself, to believe that you can do it, to know that like you've been selected out of the 200 people who applied to this, that they think you have what it takes to launch an organization. Uh, because I never would have had the audacity to launch an organization working to reduce the suffering of farm fish. I grew up in Illinois in the US. Like there's no oceans there. Like I didn't know anything about fish really. Mm. Um, I care about them philosophically, but never kind of emotionally. Mm. I've had to learn a lot since starting. So I would never would have thought that I could do this without their support. Uh, so shameless plug, uh, would recommend people, uh, if you're interested in kind of going down the career path I've gone down so far, I'd check out charity entrepreneurship. I think um, they have a pretty good program and they can help you achieve pretty good impact. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I also met like a lot of people who either went through the incubator okay, or who great. works at charity entrepreneurship. And yeah. I also super agree. Like, yeah, yeah, that's a great place to be, I think. If Definitely. you get in, yeah. If you get in and out. <laughs> now I wonder like if I would have gotten in with the, cause they have like a thousand people applying now, very, very oh, competitive. Yeah. Sometimes like, ah, oh, I probably wouldn't have made it if I applied this year. But well, it's worked out pretty well. You never know, yeah. yeah. So how did it work out? What happened after? And or first, uh, can can you say about like uh, how how did it end up being the fish welfare initiative? Like why not something yeah. else? Yeah. So the way it works with charity entrepreneurship is that you can show up either with your own idea or without an idea. I 
didn't have any ideas really when when I got involved. I kind of wanted to do as much good as I could for the world. Mm. Um, I was kind of open whether I worked like to um, help humans or help non-human animals. Um, so I had a special place in my heart for non-human animals because that's kind of where more of my activism had been focused previously. Yeah. So part of what charity entrepreneurship does is research a bunch of different charity ideas throughout the year that they recommend kind of the new incubates launch in the program. Um, and one of the ideas they had researched that year that they thought was one of the ideas that, that could do the most good in the world, kind of fitting with this effective altruism EA paradigm, is someone working to reduce the suffering of farmed fish mm. um, because of a massive number. So there's roughly 100 billion farmed fish alive at any given point. Um, that's to put into context about the same number of humans that have ever existed in the history of our species. Yeah. How many fish are alive right now in fish farms? Damn. And their situations are often quite grim. Shit. Uh, yeah. As you'd imagine for animals who are farmed um, industrially. Mm. Um, so charity entrepreneurship felt like you know, like the suffering is immense. There's mm. hardly anyone doing this. And and we think there are actually tractable changes that can be made here mm. to reduce this suffering. So they recommended that idea. And there was a few ideas that were presented to us. Um, for instance, the ideas that later launched Animal Ask and the idea that launched Animal Advocacy Careers uh, and that later launched Healthier Hens. We, all mm. these ideas were kind of on the table, but the one that my co-founder and I, and we just met, by the way, in this program in London. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know each other previously, uh, mm. but we we got along pretty well. And we thought we both kind of picked each other as like good, like compatibility fits, you know, cool. like a little yeah. dating game almost. <laughs> yeah. um, the one we liked the most was the fish one because it felt like very direct. And we were like, yeah, like we feel like we can take on a challenge, you know, where that's mm. kind of one of the benefits, I think, of of young people starting organizations. Like, yes, we're naive and idealistic, mm. but sometimes it takes that to actually change the world because people who are like more worldly and know like what works and what doesn't would never try and do something as difficult as what we're doing right now. <laughs> uh, and they would never make it work, I think, as at least as much. Damn. And what are you doing right now? So yeah, that was three and a half years ago that we launched mm. in- uh, Three and a half, you said? Yeah, three and a half three years half, ago yeah. that we launched Fish Welfare Initiative. Um, back in 2019 world felt a lot different back then in mm. some ways. Um, we were just a two people then now we're about 20 people now. Um, wow. initially we, uh, spent a lot of time kind of doing research on like how best to help fish. One big problem that I'm going to talk about in, in my talk here at this conference tomorrow. Um, one big problem that we as an animal movement have is that we don't really know how best to help fish. Like we do mm. a lot of interventions, but they're mostly for terrestrial, not aquatic animals. Mm. So we did a lot of research to kind of figure out what are the best ways of helping fish, um, including which country should we work in. So mm -hmm. I, though I'm from the U.S. and my co-founders from the U.K., mm -hmm. we were kind of impartial as to where we work. We just wanted to go where we could have the greatest impact, reduce the suffering the most. Um, so we looked at kind of like what are the welfare issues facing fish. Um, we looked at which countries are promising to work in. Uh, that process eventually led us to working on the welfare of farmed carp in India, which is actually where I live about half the year now. Mm. Um, so now in India, we have a team of about 20, 20 of us total. We work in both India and China, though our China operation is, is mostly just one person at the moment. Yeah. Um, in India, we primarily work, we primarily help fish via direct farmer work. So we have 88 fish farms there mm -hmm. who've committed to, and who are, um, not waiting for some like 2026, 2028 deadline, but right now, in fact, are improving the welfare on their farms by having lower stocking densities and having improved water quality. Hmm. Um, we're also doing a lot of research now to kind of further develop our welfare standards. So that's kind of our version one standard we're implementing now. We're developing hmm. version two as well. We're hoping to roll that out this year after hmm. some more testing. Um, but essentially we have like our local ground team that uh, signs farmers up. Then they, the farmers like lower stocking density on the next time they put kind of fish in the farm. Um, we also go around every month. We stick a water quality meter in the water to measure uh, what the water is like mm. and where things are bad for the fish. So where, for instance, dissolved oxygen is too low, which is an important parameter for fish welfare and health. Mm. Um, our team will tell the farmers, hey, here's what you need to do to make this farm better in a mm. way that is both good for the fish and good for the farmer too. It's all kind of premised on win-win, mm. um, on a win-win situation, which we think is kind of important in the kind of lower middle income Indian context. Mm. Um, and the other day when we first met <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> at, the, at the streets pretty randomly, uh -huh. I guess, but then at the animal rights activism, we did like, uh, yeah, some activism there. And then we went to a 
vegetarian and vegan like burger or you can't yeah veggie uh-huh. burger king yeah like kind of crazy um and then you told me something about or like we talked about uh when we're talking about which animals we are trying to protect or help and so on we often yeah. say like pigs cows uh sheep and like fish yeah like we just say like like uh why do we do that do you think or, or like um uh like why is it important to maybe not say it like that yeah um i mean i i was certainly as an activist guilty of of doing that not that there's necessarily anything like malicious or anything like that um but i think it broadly goes back to all humans including animal rights activists just not really appreciating fish they're they're individuals very evolutionarily uh distinct from us mm. we don't kind of resonate with them we don't empathize with them the same way we do with pigs for instance i mean to this day like unfortunately like i still get more pissed off when i see like the abuse of chickens and pigs and i when i see the abuse of fish i know philosophically that all are wrong but it, i i even and i'm working full time on this right i even find it <laughs> somewhat difficult um so that like kind of, like kind of that disconnect explains why we as a movement kind of group fish all together mm. um and the problem with kind of grouping fish all together is kind of we're abstracting away a lot of really important and really interesting, but but really kind of like significant details that would allow us to work more effectively on fish. So kind of like we were talking about the other day, I think it's best not to think of like the movement as trying, the animal movement as trying to help like cows, pigs, chickens, and fish, but rather like we um, to try to help terrestrial animals of which there's like a few different species groups. And, mm-hmm. you know, with terrestrial animals, it's mostly the same species of chickens that are farmed across the world, for instance. The same really fucked up genetics um where i've seen like in both the u.s and and farms in india it's it's the same exact systems um mostly which is not good but um with fish there's tremendous species diversity so there's something like 300 uh, species of fish that are farmed by humans um and the needs of a salmon here in norway are are dramatically different than the needs of a carp in Mm -hmm. india and we kind of need to contextualize campaigns to each of these individual species yeah, yeah. into local context. It, it, you know, we, we can think, I think as a movement about like just going from like the European commitment, chicken commitment and like helping chickens in this globalized way to helping fish in a globalized way, because it's more likely, okay, we, we do this European chicken commitment, but then we do like this salmon thing here and this carp thing over there and this tilapia thing in the, uh, in Indonesia, or the Philippines or something. Mm. Um, Yeah. So it's just, we really have to reckon with this kind of diversity and, and contextualize appropriately, I mm. think. And you said like around 300 different species? I have three, right. yeah, I, I think two to 400, I think close to 400 actually. Damn. okay. Gr- uh, species of fish farm. Now granted, most wow. most of the fish, most of the individuals are, mm. are of like a particular, f- or members of a particular few group or smaller group of species. So like um, different types of carp, salmon, tilapia, Milkfish, hmm. those hmm. mainly. Catfish, Pangasius catfish, hmm. for instance. Milkfish yeah. and catfish, funny names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, milkfish, they have the name because they look like they're white and they kind of look like the color of milk, I believe. Oh, wow. Okay, so they uh, don't milk. You can't milk the No, fish. You, you cannot milk the <laughs> not, not really. Not, and the not catfish is not like a cat. <laughs> uh, they do have whiskers. <laughs> is that those? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, like a broad question again, like many sure. of these, but like, uh, what? Why should we care about fish? Good question. You think? Like, m- as some of the people who will listen and watch are vegan, but I think like most are not. Sure. Um, and also, like when I do activism, uh, it's, it's like so many times I talk with people. And they're like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't eat any meat. Like, I eat fish, though. But like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm vegetarian, but I eat fish. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I think if you find the arguments for not um, consuming terrestrial animals compelling, I think you should also find the arguments for not consuming uh, aquatic animals compelling. And I think you should find both those arguments compelling. Um, mm. I mean, what I personally resonate with is that, you know, Yes, these these animals, these aquatic and terrestrial non-human animals, they're not like us in many ways, but um, other humans aren't like us in many ways, right? Like other people look very different than me or they like think differently or have a different, I, you know, I live in a totally different culture now in India than the, the mm. culture I grew up in. 
but that doesn't mean that they value any any morally less. And, and like what I've become fairly convinced of, especially with my studies in philosophy, that you know to kind of let's see if I get the quote right, like to to quote Jeremy Bentham, right? It doesn't matter whether they can like talk or reason. Um, what matters is can this individual suffer? Um, and we have, and so then, okay, we have to ask, okay, well, can these animals suffer, right? This is kind of an empirical question in a way. Some philosophy I think needed too, but um, the best science we have shows that, yes, like the animals that humans commonly farm, they can feel pain, they can suffer, and they do suffer hmm. quite a lot. And this also goes to fish. Um, there's, you know, there was this fish pain debate, like do fish really feel pain? Um, now it's largely settled where the there's no experimental research showing that fish don't feel pain. In fact, all the experimental research that um, kind of fish pain researchers and biologists have done show that actually there is good evidence that fishes do feel pain. And evolutionarily, it makes sense that they would feel pain. Um, so I guess kind of like the one-liner here is, is just because an individual is different from you doesn't mean they matter less. Like the history of our species is a history of kind of, you know, degrading the the moral value and inherent worth of the other because they're not like us. We think they're different. So we think they don't mm. matter. And we're doing the same mistake with other animals and especially with fishes nowadays. And kind of like, insofar as kind of like our, our work is, our work is very kind of like incrementalist on the ground with farmers and kind of like based on win-wins. But insofar as it's like part of a big moral movement, like I really want people to appreciate this and kind of to, to understand that we need to treat these animals better. Hmm. And if one decides that, okay, uh, I agree with you. Hopefully, uh, yeah. everyone. <laughs> uh, like, what are like some of the next steps? Like, what can you do to like help fish? Yeah. Um, well, not creating. So here, I, I must kind of decouple my personal views from the views mm -hmm. of of the organization, um, yeah. Fish Welfare Initiative, the organization I co-founded and am currently the executive director of. Uh, is not a vegan vegetarian organization, quite strategically so. Um, we think that kind of the best way we can reduce animal suffering is kind of being a bit agnostic about the question of whether people should eat these animals or not, but rather like you know, people are going to eat fish, people are going to farm them. That's going to be a reality for a while, at least. And we want to make the lives of these animals better. Um, so mm -hmm. if you want to get involved with kind of the work we do, I recommend checking out our website. Um, you can sign up to our volunteer form. Uh, fwi.fish slash jobs. Uh, you can see kind of our, our volunteer database there. I'd encourage people to sign up if they're interested. Cool. Um, other organizations people can look at are uh, the Aquatic Life Institute, aoi.fish, you're a group for animals, Aqualia. Um, now thinking uh, that's one way of helping fish is kind of getting involved in volunteering with organizations or donating to organizations. Mm -hmm. um, that's really important. You mm -hmm. know, like maybe you don't, have to, don't know how to reduce the suffering of fish, but fortunately other organizations do and kind of uh, you can donate to empower them. Hmm. Um, but there are other ways as well, thinking about like what you as a consumer can do. This is where my personal views kind of differ from the official line of the organization. Don't eat the animals, <laughs> I would say. Um, don't create demand for exploitative, intensive, suffering-causing um, factory farming. Um, these systems cause immense suffering to the animals. I've seen them across the world now. I can tell you that personally. Um, hmm. And I think we as kind of moral people should not uh, be contributing to such exploitative uh, mm -hmm. suffering causing systems. Um, so I, I think that's part of it. Like your dietary decisions, in my opinion, do matter, but maybe even more than kind of like the direct impact from your dietary decisions is kind of the social impact that you have mm -hmm. that like, you know, people see you and me and they kind of hear us talking and hear like our convictions and they're more inclined later to kind of change their own behaviors as well. And this mm -hmm. is kind of how we build a movement um, that's kind of like, pro um uh pro animal um mm -hmm. like sentiocentric in a way where you know we think that the fact that anyone is sentient that means that we owe them like moral care and responsibility mm. interesting <laughs> thank you um of okay so um yeah we're here at a conference uh as we briefly mentioned and uh, yeah by the way sorry for if there's a lot of sound in the background while we do this uh we're doing our best right here <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> um but so to, tomorrow you're going to speak i am uh so like can you like maybe tell us a little bit about like what are your like main points or like what what do you want to communicate there mm -hmm. um yeah so tell? yeah the the title of my talk is titled Helping Fish Around the Globe, Contextualize Approaches for Fish Advocacy. Um, and 
I'm kind of coming from a place on a more macro level. So, you know, not just talking about our own organization. I'll talk a bit about that some, but I want to kind of like diagnose and offer solutions for why we as a movement haven't helped fish that much. Um, so for instance, like we as a movement have, have been pretty damn successful at incrementalist welfare reforms for chickens. Cage free mm -hmm. has been a massive global success in my opinion. I, in my opinion, the greatest success we've ever had as mm -hmm. a movement, um, where we have, so my country, the U S which I know best, um, rates of kind of like initially is like just a few percent of all chickens were farmed in cage free versus cage systems. Now it's like mm -hmm. one in three chickens almost is oh, cage free. Wow. Okay. Uh, this is, it seems like this is very likely because of, um, all the activism and advocacy that's done, especially to get corporate commitments to for to get corporations to transition to mm. cage-free systems, it's been hugely successful. Um, I've had some momentum for cows and pigs as well, but we haven't had anything like this for fish. Mm. Um, despite the fact that fish are the most numerous group of farmed animals, so there's mm. kind of this disconnect here. Why is this? Um, so I'm going to argue tomorrow. I mean, there's various reasons, including the fact that kind of people don't resonate as much with fish as they do with cows, pigs, or even chickens. Mm. But I think the main reason why uh, we haven't helped fish enough yet as a movement is because we don't really know how. We don't have mm. the right interventions yet. With chickens, it's fairly obvious, for instance, that getting them out of a battery cage, and for those listeners who aren't, don't know, this is kind of the, the dominant system for farming chickens where they have three to five chickens roughly in a cage about the size of an A4 sheet of paper. It's horrific. It's a torture operation as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's very obvious getting those animals out of cages is good for their welfare. There's not as obvious kind of changes to make in fish farming systems, um, either because like they're harder to make um, or because kind of the industry is kind of less obvious for us to understand it. Like fish are different. They have different needs. It's, it's not as obvious to know that we need to improve the oxygen levels or decrease the ammonia levels in a fish farm uh, for fish because those needs aren't super intuitive to us. Like kind of getting mm -hmm. an animal out of a cage is. So I'm going to argue that, that we kind of um, have failed fish in part because of a failure of intervention development. And then I'm going to kind of talk about uh, what this looks like to do effectively across the globe. So like we were talking earlier, fish are tr a tremendously diverse group of farmed animals. And the ways that salmon are farmed here in Norway are very different than the ways that carp are farmed in India or milkfish are farmed in the Philippines. Um, mm. So I'll, I'll talk about like kind of what are the different features of, of these different countries and kind of what uh, modes of advocacy are kind of best suited to different uh, country contexts. And, and that will unfortunately, I think, need to be like quite diverse and quite contextualized. Um, and that's mm. unfortunate because that means kind of we're going to have to create like different campaigns in different countries a lot. There, I think there can be some like more unified, like cross country campaigns. And we have some ideas about how to do that in Asia in cool. particular. Yeah. Um, but we won't, I think, be able to scale kind of like a welfare ask at least uh, for fish as we have like cage free for chickens. Mm. Do you have any examples of that or like in different countries or maybe Norway or maybe mm -hmm. Asia of like, uh, uh, like different ways to improve, like you mentioned? Yeah. So, um, I'll give a few examples. Uh, so what we do in India is improving the water quality and decreasing stocking density for yeah. carp there. Uh, that's all premised on kind of win-win approaches. Um, Another approach that has been tried, I believe, in the UK is trying to get uh, greater enforcement for pre-slaughter stunning. So what happens currently in the UK is I believe they have some regulation requiring that fish are stunned before they're killed, as mm. I believe is the case in Norway as well. Mm. But it doesn't seem to be enforced very well. The, the stunning is super sloppy, leaving a lot of the fish not fully stunned and bleeding before they're like eventually killed, which is a horrific way for them to die. So mm. they focus more on kind of that welfare ask there. Um, another kind of campaign I've seen that Compassion World Farming worked on in Scotland was they just asked for a moratorium on yeah. future uh, salmon farms there. So kind of a bit different from like the welfareist asks that like we have or like yeah. pre-slaughter stunning, but they're right there they're just asking like, okay, don't farm any more of these oh, animals. That's so interesting. Where did yeah. you say? Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. Okay, so like a moratorium of like specific places not in the whole i mean it's it's, like, it's a very big ask right that, yeah, that has yeah. not been Huge. successful yeah yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's super hard yeah that was kind of what they were going for there and yeah. and um 
kind of thinking more broadly about the movement, I think sometimes we're almost over updating based on the success, the success we've had for chickens. Hmm. And that like, we kind of think like we have to like always take like a very welfare perspective. Um, and that's what we've done. And I think that's the right move for India, but I don't think that's necessarily, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. I don't think that's necessarily the case for all the like, kind of context where humans farm fish. I think there's context like Scotland, but maybe even more so Norway where kind of more abolitionist industry weakening approaches mm. uh, could be more promising. Do you know anybody in Norway who works with this, by the way? Who works on fish? Yeah. Um, Do I know? Y- the Norwegian Animal Alliance. It, yeah. The same starts with a D. Dyrevan <laughs> Alliance. That, that was, what, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't even attempt it. Of course, it. yeah, they do. Yeah, they, yeah. They've done some research, may have done some campaigns mm. as well. Um, yeah. But I've been quite impressed with the research they've done. Nice. But we need more. Um, that's that's only yeah. one organization, and uh, that that's totally inadequate for the scale of the problem, in my yeah. opinion. Do you know what's stopping people from coming into the movement, or like uh, how we can get more people to help animals, like in general or fish specifically? Yeah, I mean, so I think broadly we should think of the animal rights movement as a social change movement, and as a social change movement, we need to grow. We need to mobilize a lot more people. Mm. both kind of like grassroots activists who will do like crazy protest stunts, but also kind of like professionalized people who will kind of like have jobs like I do, where we're kind of like in the weeds and working very collaboratively with industry, mm. um, working collaboratively with farmers as we do. Um, so as for how we can grow the movement, I mean, various thoughts, like in terms of like growing the more like professionalized sector of the movement, I think we need to make it kind of like a more viable job opportunity for people in many contexts like in many countries in asia they just do like animal advocacy is not seen as like a real career path that you could go into or that you could kind of tell your parents about and not get like yelled at mm. for um so i think some work needs to be done there i think like mm. specifically the sort of thing i'd be interested in is kind of going to universities say in india where we work and kind of like presenting hey here's the work we do but we're just like one part of this whole broad animal movement uh, there's many career options here where you can kind of make your whole career. You know, it's it's activism, but it's also paid and you can support a family mm. with this. Uh, mm. This is a path that that you smart, young, progressive people can pursue and that you ought to consider. I mean, I, I know from my own life, it's been incredibly meaningful. My life is so much richer mm. um, because of the connections I've made in the movement and kind of the opportunity to, to fight for something much bigger than myself. Mm. Wow. <laughs> um do you have any other thing related to fish uh, which you think is nice to talk about? Just that fish are the next frontier of the animal movement and we need to innovate. I think uh, kind of like one speaker said earlier, sometimes we can be kind of too arrogant in our approaches in a movement. Like, oh, we've mm-hmm. got this figured out. Unfortunately, I think effective altruism kind of leads to a lot of this where like, <laughs> We become over certain in things that kind of like seem measurable, but it's kind of unclear what their long-term effects are sometimes. Mm. Um, I think we should kind of always be humble and probably like we should learn from the successes of terrestrial animals and the failures of, of kind of the terrestrial animal side movement. But we should also innovate and try things that haven't been tried before. That's mm. why it kind of I was saying that like I don't think it's necessarily the case that kind of we should always approach fish, at least right now, from like a uh, a welfare perspective. I think that makes a lot of sense for what we're doing in India, but I could see like different contexts kind of wanting to take more like kind of oppositional to the industry um, perspectives. And really like we're at such a nascent early stage in the, the history of the animal rights movement. I think we will succeed. We will prevail, but it's not going to be for decades at least. And I think like mm-hmm. when we look back, we'll see the era we're in right now is kind of like the very, very beginning mm-hmm. Um so I, I really encourage people to have like a level of humility uh, for fish and for all farmed animals generally when we're, we're fighting for their uh, rights and their welfare. Um, like, you know, we, we just, we don't have that much data yet on what works mm. and uh, we should invest in things that, that seem promising like corporate campaigns, but we should also kind of always be innovating um, because I expect that the strategies we'll find most promising 20 years from now aren't anything like what's being employed currently. Hmm. Uh, another thing in getting data or like resources and so mm-hmm. on. Uh, do you have any like favorite like books or documentaries or yes, anything like that? I yeah. do. Yes, definitely. Um, Please. For animal rights in particular? Uh, it could be life, but yeah, you can, okay, go, yeah, I guess I'll, <laughs> you can go both. I'll start with animal rights and maybe <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll think about life stuff. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, a few books I'd really recommend. Ethics into Action. Um, 
was mm. pretty influential on a lot of people in the movement, including me, mm. um, by one Peter Singer, whom some of your uh, listeners may have heard of before. He's been a very influential philosopher in my life. Mm. We recommend that. That talks about kind of like one of the first people to run pragmatic campaigns um, in the U.S. in the 70s and 80s. It's one by the name of Henry Spira. I'd recommend Eating Animals, which is kind of like a good, I think like oftentimes kind of like we get a bit biased, I think, in movement towards our side. But like, mm. I think this is pretty good, like impartial kind of telling of someone who like doesn't really have that much of a side, but kind of reckoning with the implications of eating animals. Um, for advocates, I'd recommend Grilled by Leah Garces. Um, that kind of, it's kind of like ethics into action that it talks about how to work collaboratively with people in the industry. I don't really believe in making enemies that much. I think sometimes adversarial kind of bad cop approaches are needed, but I think like we have a lot of room in the movement to work collaboratively. And, you know, we even deal with farmers and people, people we, you know, really respect and like as people, even if we think the practices are engaged in are, are quite egregious. Um, yeah, I'd also really encourage people in the movement to be students of history and students of other <laughs> social change movements. So a few books I've read to that effect in the past year or two that have been influential for me are Engines of Liberty, which talks about a few different social change movements. Um, this is an uprising, which talks about how to build social change movements mm. more broadly. Um, I read a book about Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez, the fight in the fields, kind of talks about like that particular movement. I would, but I'd like to read more books. Like I'm, I'm hoping to read more books, kind of about like the gay rights movement, about anti-apartheid. I'd like to read something about Indian independence, because mm. um, we should all be, we should be learning. Like the, you know, we're not, we're not the first ones to try and change the world. Maybe we have like a harder task before us than a lot of these movements, but uh, mm. we can learn a lot from them. Mm. Damn. Um, and you also mentioned effective altruism. Uh, and we're both like yeah, yeah, yeah. in the effective altruism movement yes. and animal rights and so on. Um, can we maybe start like how how are they connected, do you think? And and like uh, what, what, what are some positive things and maybe like critical feedback things around uh, effective altruism and animal rights? Sure. If anything comes to mind. Yeah. I mean, so the reason I originally kind of like really fell in love with EA mm -hmm. was because I saw it presented, uh, and I think at its best, it is this as like kind of a, a broad moral movement and moral idea that we should just try and do as much good as we can. Very mm -hmm. simple idea. I think EA kind of goes astray when it tries to add on like too many kind of like sub beliefs to that idea. I think mm -hmm. it should kind of be kind of simple in that way. Do mm -hmm. as much good as you can. Yeah. Um, and that will kind of vary based on different people's ideas. But I think that's sort of like, decentralization is probably good for making a, a more robust movement. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I, I was compelled by EA because it, it had this like broad, like moral movement, uh, thing going for it. But especially with that, it took animal advocacy seriously. It wasn't speciesist. Like I see species just kind of discriminate being kind of discriminating based on this, uh, species membership of an individual, uh, which I think is kind of unjust to do. Um, yeah, I saw it was like, you know, advocating for for the well-being of humans who are suffering extreme poverty, but also for non-human animals. And yeah. that's exactly how I feel, too, is like, mm. you know, we shouldn't like have these things competing against each other. They're suffering with humans they're suffering with non-humans. Um, these are all issues we should be fighting for. Um, mm. And I, I kind of like the idea of something more broad that kind of talked about like altruistic, like do as much good as you can, but kind of don't be partial about, you know, don't just work with humans close to you or but don't even just work with kind of species who are the same as yours, but, you know, extend your moral circles more broadly. Um, I found it very compelling. So hmm. I kind of initially viewed EA as like something much more broad, like a broader project of doing good in the world. Hmm. And animal advocacy is just like one part of that project. There's many other ways to do good in the world, I think, for humans who live now and humans who will live later, hmm. um, to be specific. Um, but I kind of see animal advocacy as like, a, like one, one part even though kind of in practice they function as two distinct communities. Okay, nice. So, and do you have anything that you're like critical of in the community? Yeah, lots of stuff. Um, those of you who have been following Effective Altruism lately will will note that it has not been a, a really good <laughs> past five months or so for the community, unfortunately. It's been tough. Yeah. Been a rough time. Mm. Um, I mean, I'd first note that like, this is a community that I really fell in love with and... Um, care deeply about. I, I launched a university group, a university effective altruism group in the US um, when I was 20. And uh, that was like, honestly, the best thing I did the whole time I was in college. Like it was really meaningful for me. I met some of my closest friends there, people who are mm. fun, but also deeply altruistic and kind. That was great. He has done a lot to make my life better. Um, 
So I, like the criticisms I have, I think, come from a place of like, I fell in love with this thing and I will always love the idea. And I, th- I think lots of us, whether or not we're involved in the EA community, will always believe that we should do as much good as we can. Mm. I don't need an EA t-shirt, an EA conference to believe that. Community is very helpful, but like, um, I will always be fighting for, for a better world regardless. And I know so many other people who are in the EA community will be the same. Yeah. I think the flaws we see in EA and kind of like some of the, the scandal, right, that we've seen in the past few months Mm. have is not from something inherently bad about the idea which in my opinion is, is almost unassailable if you have a particular like view on, on philosophy do as much good as you can that's it mm. or at least that's what i think it ought to be um yeah but but the flaws we see come from kind of how people like go about trying to implement that or kind of like the very human flaws that people have you know as the movement grows there will be more issues so i mean like with ftx and sam bankman freed um, someone who I initially thought was like very altruistic and mm. I don't, I guess it's still unclear. Like maybe he, you know, was just like, um, maybe it was all front, but maybe he was just like very like risk neutral and like maybe it made sense from his perspective trying to optimize. But, um, things retrospectively, it certainly did a lot of harm to the movement. It did discredited where I think should be like a very morally sound movement. Now look, mm. we look like con artists basically, um, who are not living very altruistic lifestyles, even like, mm. And I was like uh, laughing at like one piece of thing or one piece of news I read about like uh, kind of coming out of like the, the whole blow up of FTX is that all these unpaid debts and one was like $50,000 on like to a local restaurant called Margaritaville that everyone's eating at, right? And it's like kind of luxury like that is just, is just very far from kind of the, the very frugal, um, humble movement that I originally got involved in uh, mm. where... You know, like we're very influenced by like the ideas of Peter Singer and the book, The Life You Can Save, mm. particularly and like not trying to spend any money unnecessarily so we could give it away to people who need it much more than we do. As people like you and me are essentially rich by global standards. Um, it's like those ideas I think we've kind of gone astray from. And then we've also and other controversial things, kind of the, the few articles that people can find in The Times and more recently in Bloomberg about sexual harassment in the community. Mm. That's fucked like, I don't know. How are we going to like build a moral movement and advocate for others if we can't even take care of ourselves? Um, mm. I think this kind of comes from people, I don't know, who have like good intentions about how to do good in the world, mm. but like aren't, maybe aren't very self, like at best, they're just not very self-aware of like how other people perceive them, but at worst, like are kind of actively power hungry and kind of using their positions of power to like gain like status or like romantic opportunities Mm. everything and i mean this stuff makes me sad to the extent that like you know i will always love the idea of ea and so my close friends are other people in ea now like it almost makes me wonder whether i should continue being involved in the community Mm. um i think it will um because again i I love it but uh (laughs) It's definitely been a hard time and I think quite discouraging to many of us, especially, you know, people Mm. like me who like spent a lot of my time in college promoting this, promoting as like a a moral thing where we're giving everything we can to help other people are altruists. But then to see Mm. like behavior like this, people living in luxury and conning other people and sexually harassing people. And Mm. I just, I don't know, it feels like it's not what I signed up for sometimes. It's a bit rough now. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully we'll get through it. I mean, there's there's yeah. kind of road bumps in I think every growing mm. movement. EA is a very young movement, yeah, you know, sure. barely over 10 years old. Mm. Uh, so hopefully we'll work some of this out. Mm. I have some thoughts about kind of what we need to do there, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Do you know, um, like for people like us <laughs> who have been uh-huh. in like the movement yeah. for some time, uh, like how we can help like the EA community out of this or like in the future or like, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's important probably for people like us to not grow too cynical. I mean, part of me when I'm like, if I'm most cynical and selfish, like, okay, I'm just going to disengage for this community completely. Cause I think it's, like, it's got all these problems, mm. but no, I think like there is hope. I think we should try to reform it basically. Um, mm. so I think we should still attend the conferences, kind of like engage with people online uh, meet other people, talk with them about the ideas of doing as much good as we can. Yeah. Um, cool. I think having like kind of like really concrete ways that we do good in the world is really important now in EA. Um, cause I think a lot of where we've kind of gone astray in some ways is, um, 
often tied with like very theoretical like ways of doing good, like particularly like uh, preserving like or safeguarding the long term future of humanity, which is like very like the inventions are all, all very like unproven and unprovable, frankly, mm-hmm. whether they're actually like going to do good in the world. Um, so I think like when we're kind of suffering from from crises like this, it's really helpful to kind of like do a lot of things that show people that, hey, actually, we're not just doing these things that like maybe they're doing good for the world. Maybe it's kind of like a bit self-serving, but it's really hard to tell that. Mm-hmm. But no, like actually, you know, by improving the lives of fish on fish farms, we are making a tangible difference in the world right now that people can see. Mm-hmm. Or uh, by giving money to people in extreme poverty, like we are making a difference. That kind of builds moral credibility mm-hmm. in the movement. So I, I kind of think there maybe ought to be, especially now, like more of a focus on these like more proven cause areas. Mm-hmm. Do you have any last Thoughts, comments, <laughs> compliments, criticisms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like Norway. It's great. Well, it's a bit chilly up here, but uh, aside from that, it's great. I just came from India before now, so it's yeah. been quite the temperature change. Yeah. But on a, a more serious <laughs> note, um, I'd really encourage any of you all who kind of are interested in, you know, you kind of resonate with this message of reducing suffering for all animals, humans, and other non-human animals. Um, I'd encourage you to think about getting involved in the animal movement. So, you know, I studied philosophy and computer science. The computer science at least was, you know, that, that doesn't seem like it's necessarily a thing that like one does before they become like a professional advocate for animals. Mm. Um, but ultimately, like I didn't need the specific computer science skills. They've been sometimes helpful, but more what I needed was like kind of the ethical commitment to the cause, but also just like having good generalist skills, being a good communicator, a good writer, good at mm. organization. Um, so I encourage people to kind of get involved and know that you don't need like a particular degree or background necessarily. We welcome all sorts of people to kind of engage in this sort of work. We need to grow the movement if we're ever going to have success here. We need everyone from kind of professional um, advocates, lawyers, computer scientists, data people, um, strategists, so just like grassroots activists who are volunteering. Mm-hmm. Um, if, so if you're interested in getting more involved in the animal movement, um, I encourage you to check out an organization called Animal Advocacy Careers. They have a job board uh, online where you can apply to work at different roles in the movement. Many of these organizations have volunteering opportunities as well. So if, if that's what you're interested in, I definitely reach out. A lot of it can be done remotely. Um, so yeah, I definitely I just want to leave your listeners with the note of encouraging them to get involved, uh, become part of something bigger. I, I can tell you personally, it's been so meaningful in my own life. And, you know, most importantly, I feel like it's made the world better. Amazing. Thank you so much, Haven, for taking your time. Take care. Awesome. And for everybody, all the resources we talked about are in the description, just so you know. Okay, cool. Thanks again. Of course. Thank you.